Our final speaker tonight is Ben Marshall from Bristol University. Um, and for those of you um, who were at our meeting last Thursday on cryptography, you will see there is a very good link back to that previous meeting there. Um, he's going to talk about the X crypto uh, instruction set extension for Risk Five. Over to you, Ben. Wonderful. Can you all hear me? Excellent. So, yeah, I, I hope this talk will be a, a good demonstration of all the things you've heard about Risk Five so far this evening. That is, it is extensible that anyone can come and uh, pick it up and make it better at something. Um, and how great it is as a sort of research vehicle in academia as well. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, my name's Ben. My background is uh, CPU design and verification at a, a small company called MIPS that some of you may remember. Um, I'm, I'm part of the group at the University of Bristol. Um, I'm part of the, we're part of the cryptography group, um, but a lot of that, uh, a lot of what we do is um, sort of how you actually implement cryptography and keeping it secure. It's all very well letting the mathematicians have their um, have their day in the sun, but when the rest of us have to go and implement it, it doesn't necessarily stay secure. So a lot of our work is around that. Um, so the problem statement is this, can we make RISC-V um, as efficient as possible um, at executing cryptographic workloads while also making it more secure? Now, a uh, definition of terms um, right at the start here. So when I say a side channel, a cryptographic side channel, um, is something, some artifact of executing a cryptographic workload that lets you learn something about the secret data that's being manipulated. So the most common example of this is time. If your comp computation takes longer because your key has a certain value, that's no good. You've learned something about the key. Um, another common one that we deal with at Bristol is power consumption. So if you've got some embedded edge device um, that takes more power to compute on a key that has a larger numeric value, that's no good either. So how do you remove that as a side channel? And how do you make it possible to mitigate these sorts of side channels at an architectural level? So these are our big sort of open research questions. Um, and we look mainly at uh, in small embedded edge devices um, because quite frankly, IoT security is a trash fire at the moment and some, something needs to be done. Um, we're not gonna solve it all, but we'll do our best. Um, so what's, what's it like right now writing cryptography on RISC-V? Well, unfortunately, it kind of suffers. Uh, it suffers for a few reasons. Um, the, the biggest one is that there is not yet a bitwise rotating instruction. Now, that will come with the bit, manipula bit, bit manipulation extension, but until then, if you want to implement something like a hash function or a block cipher, it really hurts. You're talking sort of between 40 and 70% slower. So this really has an impact for something like AES or SHA-2. It hurts. Um, luckily, very easy to fix. We'll see how that works with the sort of Unix platform standards, whether that will have to subsume the bit manipulation extension because you can't run Linux efficiently without hash functions. Um, the other one is overflow detection. So part of RISC-V's appeal is that it's extremely simple. That's great, but through simplicity, you usually have to disregard something. Part of that that's been disregarded is uh, detecting unsigned integer overflow. Now, trying to do something like very long arithmetic without that gets tricky. Um, so things like public key cryptography, that really hurts. And we've done a lot of work to sort of quantify the impacts of that. Um, and then another one, which is much more general, not specific to cryptography, but more computer architecture generally, is no index load and store. So this is where you store uh, a base address in memory in a register, as well as the offset. This is really useful when you're stepping through more than one array with the same index. Um, and in cryptography, you tend to do it irregularly. Now, RISC-V doesn't have these instructions, so you're doing a lot more address arithmetic than you would normally on something like ARM or MIPS, and that has quite a big impact. I should maybe have prefixed this talk with, it's a bit more technical, it's gonna go into the details, so if I see people glazing over, I will try and pan back, but if it's all making no sense, do tell me, and I will try and, uh, try and raise the level of it. Um, so, approaches to accelerating cryptography, what can you do? Now, RISC-V is a general purpose instruction set architecture, so it's designed to be reasonably good at everything and you kind of accept the trade-offs. Um, and then if you wanna go really, really fast and you, you know exactly what you're gonna do, you're gonna build a SOC where you've got your general purpose processor and you'll have a dedicated piece of hardware that does your encryption. That's great, but it's not very flexible and you might not even have the space to put that hardware engine on there. Um, alternatively, you can go to sort of halfway house, which is what Intel did with things like AESNI, where you pick a very popular uh, algorithm and you add some instructions that accelerate um, some of it, or in some cases, all of it. Um, so you lose a little bit of efficiency, but it's, you're still way, way better than the baseline. Um, Xcrypto, as you can see, takes a somewhat scattergun approach. Uh, we're trying to make it as general purpose as possible. We don't want to pick a horse in terms of cryptographic standards to accelerate because they change over time. 
um, but we also want to make it as efficient as possible. So we're sort of at that midpoint of the tug of war. Um, so our solution, it's not the solution. There are There is a standard cryptographic extension to RISC-V being developed, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but we, uh, we think it's a good thing in terms of what we've built because it's very lightweight. You um, I'll have some uh, figures later on, but you can add it to a core without drastically bloating the size. Um, it's general purpose, so the same set of instructions can be used across a very wide range of different cryptographic workloads that work with very different mathematical primitives. And that's important because cryptographers pick some weird stuff when it comes to mathematics, um, so being able to accelerate and implement that is really important. Um, it's also very flexible, so if you want to compose it with um, something that's less cryptographic in terms of your security and more sort of traditional access control, it works very well. So if you want to support something like an enclaved execution or multi-tenancy execution, there's no reason why it won't work. It's kind of an orthogonal thing. Um, and then it's also experimental. Work in progress, any problems that you point out, I will plead this as my excuse. Um, so in terms of what we actually add, we do add some extra state. So we have an extra register file to store all your secret data. Um, the idea being that it's kind of like a floating point coprocessor. So old, um, I say old, actually, no, RISC-V does this. So RISC-V adds an extra register file to do its floating point computations on. And we thought, okay, we'll separate the concerns for cryptography as well. It just kind of makes sense. Um, it also means that if you have some very expensive side channel countermeasures for power consumption. So if you want to make all of your data operations consume a constant amount of power, whatever you're doing, you very often pick a, pick a different kind of logic style. So normally you pick CMOS, um, you might pick something weird and exotic. These things tend to be kind of expensive in terms of area. So the less of your data path and the less of your state you have to implement those on, um, the easier it gets basically. So a lot of this is about enablement. How do you enable people to implement really secure systems, even if you're not specifying that they absolutely have to? Um, in terms of the new instructions that we add, so we've got loads and stores, the new registers, um, we have a randomness interface. So this is really important. Lots of cryptography relies on a very good source of randomness. Um, so whether that's generating key material or generating masks for side channel countermeasures. Um, now, as someone who's had to do CPU verification, that kind of scared me. How do you add deliberately non-deterministic behavior into a system and still make sure that it does exactly what you want it to do. And that's been a very fun uh, thing to try and work out how to, how to specify it so that you're not uh, telling people too much about how to do randomness, just how it interacts with the rest of your CPU. Um, we had some special memory operations to make sure that you can efficiently um, implement a cryptographic construction called an S-box. So that's substitution. You literally swap one byte in, one byte out. Um, bit permutations, so we actually found that what we developed more or less in isolation was um, duplicated by the bit manipulation task group. Um, they did a much better job than we did, so we've more or less pinched what they've done, uh, which has been quite nice. Um, we had some SIMD operations, so being able to work on very narrow bit widths all in parallel is quite useful for some countermeasured cryptography. Um, support for integer carryout, long integer arithmetic, again, very simple. Um, and then we start to get a bit more specialized. We've decided that it's reasonable for certain algorithms that are extremely popular. It's all right, we're gonna add some silicon to make this as fast as possible, it's worth it. So we've, we've looked quite carefully at these algorithms and gone, right, which bits can we accelerate for the smallest number of transistors? Um, I won't go into too much detail with those, but if you wanna to talk to me about them later, please do. Um, so does it work? The answer is yes, for these benchmarks, these carefully chosen benchmarks. Um, I, I joke, obviously, we've, we've tried, to, tried to include everything. Um, so medium imp improvement, about 1.87, 1.9, um, and this is as measured um, using our hand-coded assembly for our extension versus the better of a human or the compiler. In most cases, the compiler was better than me. Um, so you can see that, that our specialized instructions for AES kind of blow it out of the water. Um, so that's kind of benefits we're looking at. Um, just going down, MP, MUL, it's multi-precision. Uh, ChaCha20 is the ran pseudo-randomness function used in the Linux kernel. Um, Kechak, Kekak P1600, that's the new SHA standard. So new SHA3, um, which hasn't been adopted because it's quite slow. Um, so we're doing, again, trying to do a little bit to fix that. Um, and then because we're working in the embedded, embedded space where memory is not infinite, as some developers would like to believe it is, 
um, we've focused on code size as well. Does it make the static code size smaller? And yes, it does. Um, this is really important, not only for does my program fit on my CPU, but also if you're working in a slightly larger system with a cache, you get better cache occupancy as well, which is really important for energy consumption. Um, so we have a reference implementation. We've done the work. We've got a simulator. We've got, a, I'll call it a formally verified um, hardware implementation based on the Pico RV32 core. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the IBEX uh, implementation finished just yet. Um, but that would have been nice. Um, so the actual overhead for adding our thing is about 30%. Now that's that might seem quite large, but we have picked the smallest risk five core that we could find as the baseline. So if you added uh, something like the Rocket Core or Ariane, um, we'd like to think that X Crypto would basically be a rounding error um, on what you add. Um, so 100 megahertz working frequency, the, the pink bits in our nice little uh, FPGA LUT map are X Crypto. Um, you might have noticed earlier when I was listing, th listing the functionality, a lot of it kind of overlaps with other extensions that people are developing for RISC-V. And this was really cool because it meant that um, we can basically borrow functionality. We can say, look, your instructions work for your thing really well, but because crypto is kind of a, a cross-cutting discipline, we could reuse all of that functionality. And whenever an engineer hears, oh, that's reusable, little, um, we get a little hit of dopamine. It's wonderful. Um, so we've basically started to borrow wholesale from the bit um, bit manipulation extension for all sorts of things, which has been really nice. Um, and I'm told, you know, you know, people in the industry, they love a good roadmap. So what, where are we going next with this? Um, we started about a year ago and we kind of came out with it at the Zurich workshop in June. Um, that got quite a lot of interest and we were really happy with that. And as a result, uh, we joined the task group. So we, we joined the foundation. They said, look, we, you've, you've done some useful work here. They kind of invited us on board. So we're now part of that working towards version 1.0. And I say um, very tentatively that we're hoping to inform what will become the, the RISC-V crypto standard. What we've built will not become it, but we're hoping to inform it. So it's really quite exciting from the point of view of an academic project. Can you imagine if we'd done something with Intel or ARM and Intel and ARM just inviting us on board to say, hey, we quite like what you've done. I don't think it would have happened. So yeah, things like RISC-V, um, the sort of, I don't know, the way that they are happy to accept ideas from other people has been really, really quite surprising. Um, and then finally, we, we want some feedback. Um, all of our stuff is open source. We're an academic project, so we, we take the high and mighty road and just publish everything and hope people will use it. Um, we've been supported by EPSRC in that regard. I've kind of blitzed through the presentation, I realize. I'm, knowledge, I, I'm aware that I've got a very technically well-informed audience in some cases, so I'm a little bit scared of the questions, which is why I've blitzed through. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry, Jeremy, I startled you there. <laughs> Not at all. Okay, thank you very much, Ben. <laughs> Question. Too quickly. I do apologize. No, no. <laughs> Paolo. Hello, uh, it's Paolo Savini. Uh, I heard that initially you talked about also uh, side channels, as um, I might have missed that probably, you know, in the rush of the slides. But uh, does these extensions as anything that addresses directly? So part of our research has been to answer that question: Can can you add extensions that directly address them? So. My, my answer to that is no. What you can do is um, tell people, here's what it functionally must do, but you leave the field as wide as possible for how they go and do it. And it's the how that you go and implement it that has the biggest impact on the side channels. But multiplication is a really nice example. You can do multiplication in constant time, you know, one cycle or 32 cycles. Or you can do something a little bit fancy that might take a variable number of cycles. The moment it takes a variable number of cycles, you're exposing a timing side channel. So it might make the rest of your software run very quickly, but all of a sudden your, your core just can't be used for certain kinds of cryptography. So it's, a lot of our work has been teasing out what part of the specifications we, we, we mandate, how it's done, and what part where we say, no, we, we advise the implementer to do it this way, but it's up to you. So, um... As far as I understand about side channels, so it's all about the implementation uh, of the 
process of the program. So you think that this extension can help at least people to understand better yes. what they are going to do, what they're going to introduce in the... Yeah, oh, yeah, that's good. it. So if, we, if we've got a, an instruction that um, does several different things and they don't need to happen in an exact order, we don't specify the order because by doing them in different orders each time you execute it, you make it harder to work out exactly what's going on. There's things like, things like that, yeah. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Watch it all back later at half speed. You can watch it. Yes. I know we've got several crypto people in the audience, so you may be collared privately afterwards. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, Ben. <laughs>